Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to Watch One. Thanks for logging on. Today, we're looking at a true modern classic. This is the Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter. This is the famed Bond, the reference 2531.80.00. That's right, it truly is the dot double O reference because 007 roared back in 1995 with Goldeneye. Now, you remember James Bond wearing this one in that Pierce Brosnan modern reboot of the James Bond film franchise. That model, believe it or not, was a quartz. So it wasn't until his second film as 007 that Brosnan actually got to sport the real deal that you see here. This is the mechanical automatic Seamaster Professional chronometer, and this watch has everything going for it. This is probably the definitive modern Seamaster because if you look at the Omega Seamaster Professional line, it started in 1957, and it ran the Rolex Submariner real close in terms of everything from the popular imagination to military orders. Right up through the early 1970s, when Omega and its Seamaster line tended to lose the plot a little bit. Now, Omega kind of vanished into that morass of quartz-era crisis uh, business apocalypse that racked the Swiss watch industry after the advent of Japanese quartz during the early 70s. And as Omega struggled, so did the C so did the Seamaster. And the reality is that it wasn't until that Bond Seamaster in the mid to late 90s, this watch, the one you see here, that the famed rival to the Submariner came roaring back with a vengeance. And this reference, which in its essential form still exists in the Omega catalog, has to be considered one of the all-time great Seamaster pros and possibly one of the all-time great Omegas. So let's break down what made this watch so iconic, how the James Bond folklore sort of played into Omega's fortunes, but also some of the advantages that this watch enjoyed over a five-digit reference Rolex Submariner during the day, and how many of them still obtain and make this a fantastic luxury watch to own now. This watch came about in 1996. Again, right after the release of the Quartz version in 1993, Omega followed up with what it called its caliber 1120. That's the highest chronometer grade ETA 2892A2 movement, very thin, almost three millimeters thinner than the Rolex 3135 in the Submariner. It makes for a very fine and flat case that for a sports watch wears quite slim. And I'm gonna show you this watch on my wrist. And I'll get into the importance of this bracelet in a moment, but you can see that at 41 millimeters, this thing is completely unobtrusive. Although it looks sizable, respectable, it looks contemporary. There's nothing about this watch that plays it as vintage at all. Despite the fact that the basic design's been around for over two decades now, this looks like, basically, in design and condition, this looks like it could have been bought yesterday. So the bottom line is that on a smaller wrist, on an average wrist, you've got no issues. And of course, Brosnan's a lot bigger than I am, and he wore it with panache. So what you're looking at is my wrist at six and a third inches, 16 centimeters. And the watch is a nice presence there. It can handle a much larger wrist. And as you can see, this bracelet has links to spare. So we can size it down to a smaller wrist, but if you have a bigger wrist, don't worry. You're good to go with this watch. Now, the other thing that's important here, in addition to just how flat it sits, so it's totally compatible with a long sleeve with dress cuffs, maybe even more so I should mention since the tumble home of the bezel is a little bit more sloped than the knurling of the bezel on the Submariner. But another thing that's important to mention with this watch is just its ergonomic quality. This bracelet was the best in the business. Back in the 1990s and even early 2000s, this was as good as it got. This watch, which features a combination satin brushed and polished link pattern, also features some of the softest and most supple links I've ever experienced. It doesn't grab skin, it doesn't pull hair, it's a pleasure to feel under the fingers and wear on the wrist, and it conforms beautifully. Now you know that the Oyster bracelets on the Rolex Submariners were often something of a joke. I hate to say it, but there's a reason that expression, the Rolex rattle, is often used, and that's because when this watch was originally built, Rolex was using hollow end links. They were using a stamped, almost tinfoil thin oyster clasp. Nothing about the fit, finish, or specification of that bracelet and clasp compared to what Omega was offering at the time. And Omega's setup is still impressive. Now this clasp, which features a robust twin trigger activation, is never going to open accidentally. It's not friction fit. It's fit by a spring retainer, so you can't pull this thing open even if you want to. You have to press both triggers and then pull it open. And once you do, you realize just how solid it is. There's hardly any play on this, just as there's hardly any play in the bracelet itself. 
not only is it smooth and a pleasure to wear, but it's very solid. And it also packs what might be one of the best hinged diving extensions in the business. Now I'm going to open that up right there. You may never use this over a wetsuit or a dive suit of any kind. Even if you never put a toe in the water, this thing's awesome for wearing over winter coats. I learned that the hard way in 10 degree weather in New Hampshire winters during college. This thing's awesome over a coat or a sweater. I can't say enough good things about it. And the watch is as tough as it looks. Rated to 300 meters, it's equally resilient as the sub in terms of water resistance. What it has that the sub doesn't have, and I realize it's just a bauble, it's a curiosity for anyone but the most committed professional diver, is the helium release valve. But I like to say luxury is about getting more than you expect and more than you need. And the bottom line is Omega undercut the price of the sub. They made a thinner watch with a finer, thinner automatic winding movement with comparable power reserve and durability and they threw in that helium release valve just cause. It's a fun little bauble again if you're breathing exotic oxygen mixtures underwater in a diving bell. It's fun to know that you could. Not that you would, but you could go down and successfully resurface without blowing out the crystal of your watch. A neat little thing and Rolex makes you pay a super premium over their Submariner to get this on the sea dwellers. So kudos to Omega then and now for including the feature. Now, you can see that the crown guards themselves are a little bit more elegant than what you get on the Submariner. In addition to being a thinner watch, it's also a finer watch. In terms of the taper, the curvature of the lugs, the fineness of the crown guards, everything about this watch is just a little bit more progressive and gradual than the Sub. So, it kind of splits the difference between a dive watch and a dress watch. And this design predated the Omega Aquaterra, so there was a very real realization at Omega during the 1990s that this thing would have to pull double duty with a suit. Heck, maybe even a tuxedo in the case of James Bond. So it's a very versatile reference, the way it wears. A lot of people ask me about the blue on this watch. How does the blue play? Is it too vibrant? Is it iridescent? And the answer is no. It's a pleasure to look at, and the dial is quite colorful in the right light, but it also plays as a classical dark bezel, dark dial, white metal combination. Very versatile. I would say that because the dial is a distinctly matte color, it's actually less pronounced than it is in press photos, and you have to remember that there was an iridescent dialed version of this watch that's often confused with the Bond reference. This is not that watch. That watch was a quartz. This is an automatic. This is more versatile. This looks right with black tie but it also looks right with a bathing suit. And the bottom line is between that bomb-proof Omega ETA chronometer caliber automatic movement, this versatile case style, you know, this bracelet among bracelets, the clasp, and the very chat-worthy great conversation factor Bond connection, and it did appear in all four Pierce Brosnan Bond films. This watch has got a lot going for it. Like I said, the basic design endures to this day in the Omega catalog, so having survived for more than two decades, you realize this watch has a timeless appeal to it. It's not something that's going to fall victim to planned obsolescence. It's not going to go out of style. In so many ways, it's already stood the test of time, and its appeal is undeniable. I love this watch. This was the first luxury watch I ever owned, and I own it to this day. And you know what? I'll own it till the day I die, because this thing has an enduring fun factor about it that regardless of what other watches you have or what other interests you develop, you'll always have a place in your heart for your first, and you'll always have a place in your heart for great design. And for me, the Omega Seamaster Professional Chronometer comes to mind in both cases. So check out this one. Check out one of the all-time Omega greats, one of the all-time Seamaster Professional greats on our website, Watch You Want.